Welcome to the Breakpoint Podcast and our Q&A segment, Ask the Colson Center. I'm the late, great Shane Morris here with John Stone Street answering your questions. <laughs> yeah, the late was a little bit of a slip, uh, although uh, I see that you're wearing a sweatshirt in Florida today. So I'm trying to figure out what's going on with that whole thing. Do well, it's have, down in the do 70s the- today, and it's ritual for us to pretend like this is, you know, cold weather. So we, 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 we dress up uh, like this in winter clothing as soon as it drops below the 80s. The iguanas are not even falling out of the trees yet. The iguanas are not even falling, right? Yeah. Anyway, well, I, I you know, I, I did but, notice you know, that. I, I, I felt was bad worried. about saying late. I wanted to say great, but it just kind of came out in a row. So yeah, I was kind of uh, worried. It's it's like, should I be, you know, should I be anticipating something here? Uh, no, don't worry. I skipped that class on prophecy and seminary. So you don't have to worry about <laughs> me you know having any sort of authority well on that i i am back here for those of uh, those of you who don't know what we're talking about here uh last week on breakpoint this week uh, maria bear joined john filling in for me while i was taking a day off and they uh they talked constantly about my uh, homeschooling background about my uh, apparent age about all <laughs> we didn't youth- want to miss the opportunity it would have been bad stewardship for us because to i'm not the there to defend myself so it's yeah hey, right, right. to be fair to be fair i make homeschool jokes when you're here too that's true that and true. you're and you're a homeschool dad so it kind I'm, of i'm a i'm a proud homeschool dad i am a homeschool junior high basketball girls dad <laughs> like i'm i'm in all in you leave room for the Holy Spirit homeschooled. <laughs> well, that was funny. We had a, actually a little situation. Uh, I won't go into much detail, you know, whether somebody was exposed to somebody else at a particular event. And then we realized it was a homeschool speech and debate event, which means like the, it was a boy who may have had the symptoms and girls. We were trying to figure out if they were exposed. And it was like, oh, no, we're good. They no were way. way more than six feet apart. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> well, we've got some questions today that are really cool. Uh, these are based on... Of course, Breakpoint commentaries and podcasts we've aired over the last few weeks, uh, on short courses we've held, um, articles and columns we've posted on the website, that sort of thing. And if you want to submit a question, if you hear something that we talk about that sort of triggers a thought and you want to hear uh, what we have to say about it, you can submit that at Ask the Colson Center at colsoncenter.org. And we'd love to hear from you. Well, John, this first question. Uh, has to do with uh, something that we have talked about with the the degendering of a romance language and someone who is in kind of a tight spot in a career uh, that that deals with this uh, with this particular issue and and you know we this is probably the third or fourth time we've heard from someone who's in a career where they're having to uh, they're having to navigate these new waters of the the politically correct language and what to say without lying or without betraying their convictions. So I'll just read this. One issue that's especially relevant at the moment is the use of the term Latinx as opposed to Latina or Latino. I work in medical research and am working on an analysis for some investigators that involves participants from Latin America. They pulled out this terminology, something I'd never heard before. I had no idea it was the new woke terminology to avoid any reference to male or female. I've increasingly had issues where investigators want to include terminology in manuscripts that I can't agree with, such as sex assigned at birth. I edit when I have opportunity because I don't want to be part of promoting terminology that has no basis in science. But I'll be honest, I'm growing increasingly concerned that this will become more of an issue in the coming years. Any words of wisdom on how to best handle these situations? I have to be honest, I find the whole woke culture's need to reframe everything and everyone on what seems like an almost daily basis exhausting. And to that, I say, amen, it is exhausting. You're not wrong to feel that way. No, it is exhausting. And you can't be woke enough, right? I mean, if Martina Navratilova, who was, (laughs) I think, the first uh, lesbian in popular culture is not woke enough, you know, for the group, neither are you and neither, certainly neither am I. it, it, it's hard. I, it, it's really hard. And, you know, to the question, I'm growing increasingly concerned that this will become more of an issue in the coming years. It will become more of an issue in the coming days, uh, in the coming months. Um, yeah. it, it's uh, th- there, There's a power that comes with being able to control all the levers of, of power and to, to use the words of a uh, very wealthy Democratic donor that advanced uh, same-sex marriage. Uh, it becomes very tempting to quote unquote punish the wicked when you have a taste of it. Um, you can see this throughout history, and I think we're seeing it more and more. Interestingly enough, you do have some left uh, 
leaning publications, even the New York Times just this week had a, an opinion piece. Uh, and of course, we had the story of Barry Weiss, who just, by, by the way, partnered with Roger Ayer. And Barry Weiss, of course, a retired editor at the New York Times, uh, a lesbian, uh, left-leaning, uh, but really disturbed by the same sort of thing that this question reflects, right? Which is this, this push towards wokeness and towards canceling anyone who doesn't uh, who steps out of line or may have stepped out of line at any point in their life. Um, and uh, she, she's with Roger Ayer, right? Who's not exactly a, a left icon uh, at any level. Um, so it, 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 it's just really interesting to watch. It would be way more interesting to watch if there weren't so many personal and cultural consequences, right? This is one of those things where if you're interested in sociology and how cultures move and shift and how things become popular and how you know ideas become dominant, th this is something to watch. Well, it's, uh, this is the playing out of the the um, uh, phenomenon in the emperor's new clothes and that old parable where you know most people, everybody can see that the emperor is naked. Everyone can see that what they're expected to say is not true, but out of self-interest, they say it. And it eventually takes somebody who's willing to, uh, you know, play the fool and say, ah, he's naked. He's not wearing, wearing anything um, to speak the truth in order to break that. Now, the question we're, we're, we're coming up against here, John, is who does that? You know, who, whose job is it to sort of sacrifice themselves to make that observation? Yeah, it, well, right. That's the question. And I, and I think um, that j just understanding that you're in the middle of a cultural tsunami is an important place to start. Hmm. Understanding that this isn't going away. So it's time to really make that decision. And I, and I think that's what, what's behind a lot of people that are writing about this right now. Um, I, I think the first words of wisdom that I would give on how to handle these situations is develop a theory of getting or a theology of getting fired. In other words, if you have to choose between lying and keeping your job, if you have to choose between lying and um, uh, saying thing that, that something that, that that's not true and, uh, you know, keeping your invite to cocktail parties, you, you got to make that decision. You got to know what it is that it, it, it is expected of you. I was just asked about this the other day, Shane, and I recommended two things. Um, number one is the poem or not the poem, sorry. Number one is the, um, the article or the essay that Alexander Solzhenitsyn wrote called Live Not By Lies. It is a, uh, a remarkable framing for citizens in uh, Soviet Russia on what it means to not lie. Now, one of the things he points out, and I would, I would apply this to this situation, is that not everyone needs to be protesting at every rally, right? Not everyone needs to pick a fight. Not everyone needs to go out there and fight everything every time. But don't be forced to say something that's not true is this punchline. And I, I just, I think that there's a lot more to that that Christians need to consider. Just don't be forced to say something that's not true. This term, uh, uh, how, do you, how do you even say it? Latinx, lat latinx? I don't even know how to pronounce it's, it. It sounds, like a, it sounds like a wild cat to me, some kind of like a bobcat or something. <laughs> it does. <laughs> we have a great zoo in Colorado Springs. It sounds like something that they'd have there, Latinx. <laughs> but, but that's something that's not true, right? Um, you know, we had the question a couple weeks ago, right, Shane, about pronouns. Um, hmm. Calling a he a she or she a he is saying something that's not true. I don't think that applies when someone says, you know, I want my name to be because the name refers to them. And we have traditional female names and traditional male names, but that's different than saying he or she, because that's not referring to ultimately that person that's connecting sure. that person with a, with a gender. And you and know, I, someone can change their name too. Like people change right. their name all the time. They can't yeah. actually change their gender. You right. Know, they think they can. You know, the, the live not by lies essay also walks through like 10 or 15 things in a list that says, you know, d if you find yourself here, uh, you know, leave. If you find yourself in front of a movie or a television show, you know, turn it off. I mean, and some of these things are going to be pretty dramatic uh, things. And I, I don't know that his list applies to everyone, but I, but I think it's a, it's, it's something to wrestle with. It's a good place to start. Uh, and I, and I, I think you need to be ready uh, for that. I, I would say that one of the things I love about this questioner uh, is this idea. I, you know, that she has some editing role or he had, I don't know if it was a he or she that asked this question, but with this editing role that they've played in terms of correcting some of this terminology, like, mm -hmm. like sex assigned at birth. What, what a remarkable, ridiculous 
statement. I mean, look, I've been in four of these rooms when a baby is born and the doctor goes, hmm, what should it be today? You know, I mean, it's it, it's not up in the air. It's not a, flip a coin. Well, and, and did you notice, too, that this person works in medical research? Right. Do you know do you know that, that there are some treatments that work really well for men that don't work for women? Yeah, we're physiologically different. Medical research, right. it, it's, it's pertinent to know the biological sex of a person in yeah. that field. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, uh, a, a man can't get uterine cancer. Huh. Uh, I mean, it, 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 so it's to to try to degender medicine. You know, we often say ideas have consequences, bad ideas have victims. This is medical victims. Like you literally, and and, and here's the difference: you you have to blur all kinds of other language once you start blurring this, right? Mm -hmm. So suddenly, something that becomes mutilation, something that is inherently a mutilation, like a gender reassignment surgery, is what it's called, actually becomes a uh, not something that heals, but something that harms, right? You you, yeah. you amputate perfectly healthy body parts and call it medicine. Hmm. So that's yeah. I, I think there has to be a wisdom. Uh, you know, uh, Frederick Nietzsche once said, all truths are bloody truths to me, which I've met a lot of Christians that seem to live by that motto. And I, I don't think everything's worth fighting and dying over at that same level or picking a fight over, I guess. But man, I, I just think there's something to this idea, live not by lies. Just don't be forced to say something that's not true yeah, yeah. and count the cost ahead of time. This is all, you know, biblical stuff, I think. Well, that's really key, counting the cost. And yeah. As we do that, I think we need to remember that it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily have to be the case that we're faced with a choice between, you know, a losing our job and, and putting into action that theology of getting fired versus knuckling under and basically living by lies that may be in many different fields that there is a third option, which as you pointed out earlier is to simply, you know, use names but not use pronouns that are dishonest that are actually lies and not true to true to reality. and this is coming to every field i i had a remarkable conversation this week shane uh and learned about a college student that's facing yeah. this so this college student was given a paper and an assignment with a, a set of topics that they could apply to a set of you know arenas like i don't know all the details but they she was basically told here are the sources you can use you can't use other sources so what she ended up doing, and all the sources, guess what, were woke, right? right? So what she ended up doing was using those sources and using additional sources, and they marked her down for it. Wow. That's because she disagreed with the definitions. I mean, so the, this is a college-level class having to do with social ethics. Yeah. And it's like, you can't question this definition. You can't question this opinion. And you're like, what is, this isn't education at any level. So what, what our, our medical research friend here is feeling, it's being felt in a lot of different areas of culture. You know, my wife told this story um, a couple of times. I had forgotten she actually had this encounter. But in college, she was in this situation where, you know, the, it's a full classroom. The professor is lecturing on, um, on, on some topic that ended up touching on abortion. And he reads this author who says that abortion is the same as infanticide. And um, he starts asking questions of the class. And, and, and my wife gives this answer. This is before I met her. She gives this answer and, and the professor asks, are you saying that abortion is the same as infanticide? And all, the, you know, all eyes turn to her and she goes, no, the author of the passage we just read is saying that. And, and so, you know, she just sort of, she just sort of pushed it off on the, uh, you know, on the research that the professor was having them do. But yeah, that's those are the sort of survival tactics I guess you have to develop. You know, there needs to be a, a consciousness of your own self interest, but also a consciousness of the truth yeah. and a very, very deliberate decision to not live by lies, but also, um, you know, not necessarily to get run over by the freight train. It's, it's hard. Yeah. It's a really hard situation. And we got to have these conversations now again and again and again because more people every year are going to find themselves in this exact situation. Yeah. And evil's super creative, right? I mean, that's the thing. Mm -hmm. And um, there, there, there's going to be things we haven't thought of. One of the things I love about Sultan Eaton's piece is he goes, you know, this isn't an exhaustive list, but if you practice these, you'll be better equipped to handle a situation you hadn't yeah. thought of yet. Yeah. 
And we, and, and, and that's the thing is we, we haven't really practiced this, right? I mean, the, the absolute, um, you know, uh, outrage when someone suggests, hey, maybe we should turn porn off of our internet providers, at least until somebody asks about it. And it's like, man, you are committing, you know, this is free. You know, it, 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 you're violating free. I mean, just ridiculous sorts of responses. Yeah. And, um, and, and uh, so I, we just haven't had any practice on this for a long time. I, I, I often use this illustration when I'm talking about this um, in front of groups of students or, or adults. I, you know, when I was a kid, I distinctly remember in a Sunday school class, the teacher closing her eyes, uh, uh, telling us to close our eyes and saying, you know, imagine that somebody, you know, uh, you're, you're a missionary somewhere and, and somebody barges in and says, do you believe in God? Or, you know, it's, you know, if you say yes, you'll die, what would you do? You know, and kind of try to put us in this missionary martyr mindset, thinking that, you know, it's easy to get the right answer there. It's just like everyone looks back and goes, I would have been an abolitionist, right? You know, I would have been a martyr, but, but never, ever imagining, never, ever imagining this teacher or any of us that, that we would have to deal with the, um, you know, Rod calls it soft totalitarianism, but it's just the pressure of uh you know losing a grade i mean getting made fun of in a class is one thing yeah you know losing your scholarship losing your career path that's a different thing losing your job losing your pension you know these are different questions there's different things at stake than there were just just yesterday culturally speaking yeah what does it remind me of uh you know i'll never deny you lord even if i have to die (laughs) (laughs) like 12 hours later yeah, right. Yeah. Well, we've talked about a medical research professional in an, an a defensive position. Let's talk now about a teacher in a public school in in who wants to kind of assume a more offensive position, not just on this issue, but on a whole host of issues that uh, this person's facing with students. So I'll read the question. I'm a government teacher at a public high school, 34 years experience. I'm watching students arrive as seniors who have been indoctrinated in evolution, postmodern, post-truth thought, and I have no legal way to share Christian truth with them. I've read and listened to everything I can find from key thinkers, Abdu Murray, Sean McDowell, Nancy Piercy, etc., but I don't know how to argue against their truth, quote unquote, if I can't appeal to Christian truth. I've literally had students tell me that we cannot judge ISIS because they're living their truth, even though I literally have them read Uh, chapter one of C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity and Alan Bloom's Closing of the American Mind. They have bought into the idea of critical race theory and history being a social construct. But so do you have any advice for someone trying to defend Christian truth or material to read or show that I can use in a public school setting? As an aside, I taught biblical apologetics for many years to high schoolers. So it's not about needing content per se. It's about how I can reach them with my Christian hands tied, so to speak. Thanks for any suggestions you have. Oh uh, yeah, what a great question! I, yeah. I've been looking forward to this question that was solid. Uh, for a uh, for a while, and I'm and, and I'm glad this person is is dealing with um, something that a lot of us are going to have to deal with, right? Which is knowing the right answers isn't always enough. Uh, knowing what to say isn't always enough, especially when you're dealing with uh, you know someone uh, else. Uh, years ago, I was uh, speaking to a, a group. Uh, and a teacher of an honors English class at high school came up to me and she said, here's how I teach worldview. And she said, I have my students read the New England Transcendentalist. I have them read 1984. Mm-hmm. And then I have them read, uh, I think Dostoevsky. I think she went with a, a, a Russian source. And she said, and we talk about the difference of worldview. This is where worldview matters. Now, let me just be really clear. When you try to tackle bit by bit all the wrong beliefs of popular culture or the wrong beliefs of evolution and postmodernism and critical race theory and da 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 da, it, it is a little bit like playing whack a mole. And this is Francis Schaeffer's wisdom of we need to learn to think in totals. And teaching at the level of worldview allows you to do that in a way that directly challenging. But let me put it this way. Once you teach on the level of worldview, then challenging direct beliefs of different worldviews makes more sense. There's more intellectual and emotional pegs to hang these on. 
And that's one of the things that I think this particular teacher has a remarkable opportunity to do. Now, this is not a money back guarantee. This will work. Definitely just try this $9.99. And by the way, if you order now, we'll send you two. That's not how this is working. Okay. But as a government teacher, you have the opportunity to demonstrate uh, the difference of worldview, not just the difference in, in government systems or economic systems. Hmm. So when you look, for example, I just uh, have a commentary that will be uh, coming out. I think it might even be today. It might be tomorrow on Breakpoint, having to do with economics. Um, capitalism or the free market system doesn't offer a theory of everything. It offers a way that you can arrange and organize markets. It assumes certain things about human behavior, but basically it rises and falls on the morality of the people employing it. Communism, on the other hand, has an entire system. Uh, free market system doesn't answer the question, what's wrong with the world and how do we fix it? Communism answers that problem, right? And so it totalizes things and then has to use state uh, force in order to impose the totalizing effect or the totalizing views that it has. What a remarkable thing to, uh, to, uh, you, you know, to, to, to compare. And, and I think that going back and showing the, the fundamentally different visions of reality. And remember, in worldview, worldviews answer a set of questions. And to go back with each of these government theories, the theories of organizing government or economics or whatever, or talking about political histories and revolutions, by answering what's called the ultimate questions. Where did everything come from? Why are we here? What happens when we die? What's right and wrong and who decides? And what does it mean to be human? Another set of questions you can ask is, what's wrong with the world and what's the solution? And when you compare those, then what it does is it gets beyond the popularity of a particular view culturally, um, and it actually gets to something much more fundamental, uh, which is, listen, you know, what vision of reality, what vision of the human person is this really portraying? And is it true? Is it accurate? And so comparing on worldview, to me, is a much more important starting point and far more effective than just isolating particular beliefs in postmodernism or critical race theory or something like that, and then trying to smack that down. Yeah. When you do that, um, and by the way, we love doing this. Um, and if you're a teacher listening to this, th this is one of the reasons we produced a whole in-service professional development program in partnership with ACSI this year called Worldviews and Cultural Fluency. And if you come to breakpoint.org, we'll link you to that. We have about 10,000 teachers, I think, that have been engaged with that content. And maybe that could be helpful for our questioner as well. But um, when, when you do... Um, when, when you do uh, start at that level of worldview and those questions, right, uh, then what you can do then is get to consequences uh, and, um, uh, you know, this is kind of where you can get to the Pascalian wager or, you know, different views of that, which is, right. well, where does this lead? Um, I once, for example, had a conversation with a lady on an airplane who, who told me something that is emotionally very appealing right? Which is your God, you can determine whatever you want. There's no one to tell you what's right and wrong. And so I turned around and I said, huh, so if I'm God, what if I look deep inside my heart and I determine that what's true and good and right for me is to torture little babies for fun? Mm. What then? Is that okay? Now, I never critiqued this relativistic view that she had. I asked a question, which also brings up the other thing that I wanted to say to this is once you lay out the worldview, you can actually then take them to where it necessarily leads, right? Mm. That's a really effective way to do it. So you can kind of show, here's the different frameworks they're coming from. Um, why do they come from this framework? What if this framework is right? Where does that go? The other thing that I think can be really effective and, um, you know, for example, having them read Mere Christianity and Closing of the American Mind in a culture where, uh, which, by the way, both are fantastic and everybody should read them. But, but, it, but it's not a way to indoctrinate them because we live in a culture in which uh, we have too many, too many authorities, too many experts. So there's an inherent built-in skepticism among Gen Zers that even Gen Xers didn't have. And we were the most skeptical of all, right? In other words, there's a skepticism and a cynicism about truth. And um, 
so I, I, I would say that if somebody doesn't like a belief, it's far more effective in the, the, today. Students don't like a belief. It's usually far more effective than, you know, however you can get at it. But so that's why one of the tactics that is incredibly important are asking questions. Hmm. Uh, and uh, by the way, you can find this in the book Tactics by Greg Kokel. Maybe you've already read that, but I would go back through that because there's a set of questions as a teacher in a public school setting that you can use to challenge critical thinking and challenge belief systems uh, without ever saying you're wrong, here's why, I'm right, here's why. Hmm. And I think there's, um, there, there, there's two really, really important ones. The first one is, what do you mean by that? Uh, and that, of course, gets to the heart of definitions. I believe in justice. Well, what, what do you mean by justice? You know, yeah. I believe yeah. that, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, truth is relative. Well, what do you mean by truth? What do you mean by relative? Uh, and then the second question is, um, how do you know that's true? Because yeah. we live in a culture in which definitions are assumed and assumptions get, con or uh, uh, sorry, we live in a, a culture in which definitions are assumed and which assertions get confused for arguments and you can do a remarkable job as a teacher forcing definitions and forcing that um uh, uh that that in a certain people don't get away with just making assertions make them make them arguments you mm -hmm. know um because that's really what's at so anyway you, you scratched a niche man we love educators <laughs> i've worked with educators for a long time uh i have a uh i, I thank god for the uh, uh, Christians who are employed at public schools that are faithfully trying to make a difference. I, I'll get in trouble. We always get hate email when I say this as a homeschool dad. The homeschool only folks will let me know. And I, I didn't say put your kid in public school. I didn't say that. I, I have different views on that. But what I'm saying is, is that we still have an opportunity in some places for public school teachers to care about this. And, and, and to make a difference. And as our questioner is saying, it is so, so, so hard. But there, but, but there are ways to uh, put stone, put, as Greg Kokel would say, put, put pebbles in their, in their shoes. Shoe. Right. Yeah, that's right. So they walk with a limp uh, and they can't really, you know, and it may be that you're going to put a, a, a question like that in their shoe. Uh, whoever this teacher is, after 34 years, my guess is you've already mm -hmm. put a whole lot of stones and a whole lot of shoes and it might be five or 10 years later um, in which a student goes, I, you know what? I, I can't make sense of that from my perspective. Mm. I need something else. I need a worldview, as Steve Garber would put it, that's bigger. Yeah. And um, anyway, I hope, I hope there's some helpful stuff there. Well, just, a I mean, just asking questions is so key because my, my sister is a public school teacher. Uh, she teaches elementary. Um, I forget which grade, but many of these same pieces of advice, many of these same problems are going to apply there. And questions are this, you know, Socratic means of getting students to realize the inconsistencies and the dead ends of the worldview that they've been inculcated in for themselves. They can see these things and you don't even have to use Christian, um, you know, Christian books. Like you, you don't have right. to point them to C.S. Lewis as awesome as that is. And I'm, I'm glad that this teacher is able to do that. You can, you can quote Nietzsche, you know, you can quote secular thinkers who have seen very clearly um, from the beginning of this whole uh, death of God thing in the West, what the consequences would be, how it would play out, the way we would inevitably lose all frame of reference for moral truths and absolute claims and where, you know, raw power would ultimately become what wins out. You can, you can point students to that and then say, is this, is this sort of something you agree with? Do you think Nietzsche's right? Do you think this is the right way to, to go about things? Or do you think that there's moral claims that actually correspond to reality? Like it's wrong to torture children for fun, mm -hmm. stuff like that. If there, if there are, then you need to provide a source for those. You need to think deeply about where they come from. I'll tell you what, one piece of advice that specifically I'd give this, this uh, listener writes in about um, this listener asks about the the sort of woke SJW views, the social justice views that these students are coming in with alongside moral cultural relativism. Hello, mm -hmm. we have a huge inconsistency here we, we can exploit uh, to, to claim that women have rights universally 
or, uh, or, or gay people have rights universally, or it's wrong to be racist and discriminate against people universally. And then to turn around and say morality is a social construct, right and wrong are, 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 are things that we've invented for social uh, convenience. Those two things don't mix. You can't, <laughs> you can't mix them. Um, and just to point out that inconsistency, it's so easy, I think, uh, to, to, to point to ISIS and say, okay, you say that what ISIS is doing is just, you know, they're living their truth. They're doing what's right in, in their eyes. Do you have any problems with them throwing gay people off roofs? Do you have any problems with them, you know, mutilating and subjugating women? Any problems with the rape camps? Any of that? No? I mean, they're just living their truth. Yeah, if, if that inconsistency, I was just reminded when he said that I've had students tell me we cannot judge ISIS because they're living their truth. Yeah. Uh, my last semester teaching college freshmen, I had uh, students tell me that white supremacists uh, were right according to their own views. And I mean, you, you talk about a collision with uh, the critical race theory. There, yeah. there, that would be an interesting one, right? I mean, I, I'm really, John, I'm really excited about this emerging. Uh, moral consensus in the secular world. And I'll tell you why, because relativism is really obnoxious to deal with. It's just like, oh, okay, come on, quit, quit pretending like you don't believe anything's true. Of course you believe stuff is true. And you just have to run that play again and again and again. But when people are, as my generation is, thundering moral pronouncements, when they're sort of, when, when, when cultural and moral relativism has gone out of fashion and they're saying, no, this is true, for everyone universally, you can't be racist, you can't be sexist, you can't discriminate against people. These are moral claims. Where do they come from? What's the basis of them? Where, where did mm -hmm. they get this moral passion from? It, it, um, it, the first person who turned me onto this was uh, Dr. Chris Leland. And I think he, he taught for a long time at Colorado Christian. He may still be teaching there, but he was a professor at the Focus on the Family Institute. And he's like, the thing you need to notice about the new atheist and then at that point, the emerging social justice movement is just how moral they are, how morally certain they are. They're not, they're not out there saying truth is, a, is, is socially determined. I mean, they may say that, but then they turn right around and, and contradict themselves, as C.S. Lewis said, the next moment. Um, you know, that's not fair. You can't do that. That's unjust. That's not right. They march on Washington on a regular basis saying what this president said is not right. What this movement is trying to do is not right. Now, we may disagree with their moral claims such as women have a right to kill their offspring, things like that. But the fact that they're making moral claims in the first place tells us something very key. And the worldview that they're trying to you know, draw those out of, it won't sustain them. It will not sustain moral claims. We can point that out. A teacher can point that out in public schools, I think. Yeah. So let's just sum it up here, just because we, yeah. we've been in a lot of different places. One is, is come back to compare worldviews in the original sources of government theory, compare the different visions of um, political systems and what they say about morality, ide you know, human identity uh, and design and creation. Um, compare at that level before you go after the specific wrong beliefs of another uh, position right. so that you offer that framework. Ask really good questions. Um, what do you mean by that? How do you know that's true? Um, find those specific cultural entry points. This is what Shane was talking about, of uh, the, the collision of relativism and moral certain, certainty. By the way, I think another one that you can probably find, and this goes right along with showing com competing sources, is we said this a couple of times on Breakpoint, is that there is a whole group of people that aren't supposed to exist, right? Um, people with same-sex attraction who do not follow their hearts. Hmm. Uh, people that have had abortions that do regret it and have changed their minds. Um, Amy Coney Barrett, <laughs> she's just not supposed to exist. <laughs> people, right? people who, um, you know, who doctors said, well, you ought to abort that kid. Mm -hmm. They're going to have a disability. And now they're living with the disability and they say, I am glad I'm alive. I'm glad my mother didn't have me killed. They're not supposed to yeah. exist either. People who thought they were born in the wrong body and found out that they were born in the right body. Hmm. These people aren't supposed to exist. They, they just literally aren't supposed to exist. And, uh, and in the name of kind of showing another view, which is something as an educator, you should still be able to do. Um, uh, not, not everywhere. <laughs> Refer back to our first question. Um, and not everywhere are you allowed to do that. But, uh, but, but that's a, th those are some, some critical things. I, I will say, and I'm, I'm going off a hunch here, okay? 
that sometimes those of us that have been trained in apologetics, and I catch myself doing this all the time with some of the, with my own daughters, with Abigail's friends, so on, yeah. is that they have questions, and I know the answer because I've studied this stuff. And what I want to do is say, oh, well, here's how you think about it, that, 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 right? And I give them my answer. And, you know, if anyone had the answers in history, it was Jesus. And he chose to ask questions before he gave answers. Mm -hmm. And I think we don't do enough of exposing the holes in somebody else's thinking before giving them the right answer. I just don't think we do enough of that. I think we almost need to do it to a fault. Uh, especially today, because the fundamental questions, by the way, and this kind of reflects this, this journey from the questions about evolution and relativism and God's existence to now questions about social theories, uh, critical theory, and so on, mm -hmm. is we are in a shift from fundamental questions being, is Christianity true, to being, is Christianity good? And to hear that distinction is a very, very important thing. Um, you know, we've talked about this. We've been talking about the rightness or wrongness of sexual behavior for a long time. Sexual be the questions about sexual behavior have moved beyond morality to identity. And um, these are fundamentally different questions, but what a great conversation. Lots yeah. to talk about there. Great question. Thank you for that. Great question. Yeah. Well, John, we have one more question we want to tackle before the conclusion today. And this has to do with uh, Bibles, with the reliability of Bible translations and uh, how we know that we're actually reading God's word. This listener writes in, how do we know which Bible or Bibles are properly interpreted from the original? Even God tells us that there will be Bibles written that will teach a false gospel. I have used both the New American Standard Bible and the King James, which I'd say are pretty similar, and to my limited knowledge, accurate interpretations of the Bible. But what if they really aren't? I thought I felt discernment from the Holy Spirit in response to both of these. Now, after years of believing this, I find myself asking, what if I'm wrong? After all, at best, they were translated hundreds of years after Jesus ascended to heaven. I think the powers of darkness are messing with my mind, but it's still a valid question. One thing right out of the gate that I, that I think we should note is that an interpretation and a translation are not the same thing. And the two Bible versions that were mentioned here, these are translations. So that's, uh, that's one thing we need to make clear right away. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. And I appreciate caring about this stuff because yes. um, at first and foremost, I mean, th th to me, the biggest problem we have in the church is not people reading the wrong translations. It's people not reading it, right? Yeah. I mean, they're reading <laughs> devotional books. They're reading- which, which translation should I read? Well, just pick one and actually <laughs> read it, okay? <laughs> and actually read it. I mean, we have Bibles for every occasion, every stage of life, you know, teen Bibles, kids' Bibles, yeah. men's Bibles, women's Bibles, you know- I'm pretty sure there's Bibles. an Avengers Bible out there. I'm pretty sure. Oh, is there? I'm, I'm buying that one. That one sounds yeah. awesome. Um, but uh, so, 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 yeah, I mean, that's the key thing is, is, is dive in. And I appreciate you care about that. And even kind of the trend towards study Bibles is we spend a lot more time reading the study Bible notes than the actual Bible. Hmm. So here, here's a quick framework to, to help. And I'll give you a punchline up front, which is most of the translations that we have are very reliable and accurate reflections of the original text. And they have to do, when you talk about interpretation, it, it, it has to do with trying to get the right word for today, because at some time language changes, you know, we don't have a phrase, superfluity of naughtiness, which is in the King James and <laughs> my favorite King James phrase. I mean, that's just not something that anybody would. Any, Daddy, why know, am I grounded? A superfluity, superfluity. of naughtiness. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to bring, make, make that great again. Um, the, uh, you know, so, so you're trying to update the language. And then there's also cases where there's not an accurate uh, parallel word. So, for example, we often say, well, there's five there's five Greek words for love. Hmm. No, there's four Greek words for the way God designed and implemented human relationships. And we just have one sad one that's been hijacked by Hallmark. <laughs> right. And it, it, in other words, there's not an equivocation there. And so hmm. that's the sort of challenges that they have. Now, in order to solve that gap, there are translations that run the spectrum to from word to word, yep. to phrase to phrase, to concept to concept. Or the dynamic equivalence. Of, yeah, that's called dynamic equivalence. But they're basically trying to communicate the essence of the text. Word for word, they're trying to say, no, we're trying to give you the exact word as much as possible. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and so uh, you need to understand that going in. Um, the versions that were mentioned, King James and American Standard, these are word for word translations. The NIV, you're kind of going more uh, uh, phrase by phrase. And then right. when you 
get to something like the Living Bible or the New Living Translation or something like that, you're getting more of, you know, into that, um, uh, that that area of dynamic equivalence or concept by concept and yeah. trying to make it. And, and then when you re, when you hit the message, you're basically in a you're you're in commentary territory at that point. It's well, and that's yeah that that la, that kind of far uh, side of the dynamic equivalence falls into commentary because you're right. trying to figure out and trying to say something that preaches as opposed to what, what it actually says. Now, mm -hmm. I don't think that means that there's something necessarily wrong with those things because we listen to preaching all the time. Sure. The New Living Translation, for example, I wouldn't say that, you know, I would rely on it solely for the authority of the church, but I tell you, there are some things that it does that is extremely helpful. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, and, and so, so, so you just need to know that going in. Now, let me say two more things, uh, and then I'll, I'll call it a day. Uh, the, the, the first thing is, is within that spectrum, and you knowing where these translations come from. So like the New World Translation coming from the J-dubs, yeah. there's a theological problem that they're bringing to the text. This isn't one you want to rely on. The Book of Mormon, you don't want to rely on that, right? But within the framework of accepted um, translation groups, they're going to do pretty good. Mm -hmm. I would be spider sense wary of some uh, some translation that is trying to update a social uh, update the text not just to co contemporary language but to a contemporary social agenda. Mm -hmm. uh, the um, the NIV folks ran into that that wall uh, a couple of years back, but by and large, uh, you're, you're going to be in good shape. Uh, I really like the ESV. I think it lives right in between the word for word to the phrase by phrase. It's super faithful. It's good language. I, I think it's really helpful. The HCSB, which is the uh, new Apolo uh, the Apologetic Study Bible and the Apologetic St Study Bible for Students, which I've contributed to, those are uh, th those those are great versions. So, in other words, be be at peace on this. Like mm. the other thing, the, and, and the reason the way to be at peace is to remember, God has preserved His Word remarkably. I mean, if you think about how messy church history is. And then you think about what we now have in our hands. Yeah. And now in the last uh, 100 years, the distance between the original manuscripts and the manuscripts that we are now using to translate has closed in the Old Testament by over a thousand years. In the New Testament, we're kind of in the first century. It's unbelievable, right? Yeah. The more manuscripts we find, the more we realize that by and large, we are working with the original. And this is great. This is, you have to understand. And, and th this is in the middle of church history. This is, you know, the great schism, the Protestant reformation. I mean, just go down the line, think of everything that took place, right. Uh, um, you know, prosperity preachers. And um, I was going to make a joke about televangelists. I mean, the Bible has survived it all. It's unbelievable. And you can have a lot of faith in that. And, and you should have a lot of faith in that. And then second, one of the ways to have a lot of faith in that is to read it with the people of God. Because a lot of times we're like, well, can I trust this for God to speak to me? Every book in the Bible was written for communities, not for individuals. It doesn't mean you don't individually read the Bible. It just means you don't just individually read the Bible, be in a community that's committed to the word of God. Um, there's people have written on the kind of the whole translation process. It's super helpful. Yeah. Uh, isn't, does Lee Strobel tackle this in some of his books? I know there yeah, are a bunch of most apologetics, apologetics books the... are going to do that. Um, and, and they're going to do it well. Yeah. Uh, you know, th this is something that was a big, and, and just for our listener to, un to, to know, uh, this was a central question of the mid uh, late mid 20th century. Okay. Yeah. So, Think about 1970s, 1980s. This is the hot topic in apologetics. Hmm. Do we know what Bible we have? And how do we make sense of it? And so these are questions that have been well answered. And, um, and, and, and the punchline is, is have confidence. Hmm. Because what we have is really, really good. What most translations are doing is really, really close. Trust the Holy Spirit to preserve his word to you because the Holy Spirit's been darn good at preserving his word, period, to the whole world. Yeah. And he's given it to his church. And so be a part of a community of God when you look at it. I'll close with this, John. When I, when I used to read the Bible, I would typically do the sort of piecemeal verse by verse thing. 
and then just you know hang my hat on this one verse. I don't think that's the way it's meant to be read. If you notice, especially in the New Testament, um, most of the content is ordered in a in in the form of a letter that's meant to be read aloud to a church, right? This is what all of Paul's epistles are. This is what James is. This is what Peter's epistles are. They're supposed to be read aloud as one big continuous thought. So I would say when you pick a version of the Bible or multiple versions, which is what I like to do, um, read big thoughts. Don't read, don't read little tiny snippets or verses. Remember, the verses are not inspired. The, the verse numbering is not inspired. Neither are the chapter headings. Those are things we've put in there for convenience and navigation over the years. The, the text itself is meant to be read as a continuous flowing thought. You know, you can't take a snippet out of Hebrews and say, this is going to be my, my big theological thing for the, for the years, this little snippet or verse. You got to read the whole thing because it's one coherent argument. Um, and if you do that in multiple translations, and I'll tell you what, I know this is heresy for my my fellow Calvinists, but um, the old I, I, w- I wouldn't really mess with the new NIV because it's obnoxious with the gender inclusive language. But the old NIV uh, from the 70s, that one is actually one of my favorite translations to read because it flows so well. And you can very easily get the big idea of what the author is saying. And oftentimes, um, the, those language gaps and those insufficiencies of English. And that, like you talked about where, where there were five Greek words for love and there's only one English word for love. Um, and, and that seems pathetic on the surface, but if you read it the way the translators put it together, you will grasp these ideas. You will get in first Corinthians, first Corinthians 13, that Paul is talking about a kind of love. That's really different from the kind of love that our culture is talking about. Even if you don't know the word agape or, you know, even if you've never taken a Greek class. So um, I would say read big pieces of the Bible, read it in big chunks and get the, get the big thrust of the idea that, that each author is trying to give. Um, and then you'll, you'll be a lot better off because of that. So Bible's reliable. Um, there's plenty of apologetic resources and we can link, link to some of those, uh, for the manuscript history of the Bible. You can trust that the Bible you're reading is the Bible that was actually written. It is, it, 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 you know, it's reliable. It's on a level of jots and tittles. Um, the, and the second thing is read the Bible the way it's meant to be read, not in little snippets, grasp it as, uh, as, as whole, complete, coherent thoughts. Good. Well, thanks so much for listening to the Breakpoint Podcast, folks. We'll be back next week answering more of your worldview questions. Drop us a message on social media or email, and the address is askthecolsoncenter at colsoncenter.org, and we'd love to hear from you and answer your questions. For John Stone Street and for the Colson Center, I'm Shane Morris. Thanks for listening.